Welcome to your week six lecture. You should have read these three chapters by now. Let's get started. The renal system consists of the kidneys, ureters, bladder, and urethra. In this lecture, we will review the anatomy of this system and then go over the physiology and pathological conditions. First, we'll begin by talking about how the body deals with fluids and electrolytes and what happens when the fluids and electrolytes are out of balance. Then we'll discuss the kidney and the bladder. The human body is mostly water and how that water is moved around, stored, and used is very important for us to maintain homeostasis. The intracellular fluid, which is the fluid inside of the cells, contains most of our body weight and fluid. The extracellular fluid, or the fluid immediately outside of the cells, this is found in the intravascular space, or the space inside blood vessels. Interstitial fluid is a fluid between cell layers, or cells and blood vessels. It is the fluid of the tissues. It normally lacks proteins. Hydrostatic pressure is the force of fluid pressure from the bloodstream. It keeps the blood vessels open and aids in diffusion and osmosis. This pressure uh, pushes fluid into the interstitial and intercellular spaces. Osmotic pressure is the pressure of osmosis. Remember, osmosis is the diffusion of water only and can also be looked at as water heading for a higher concentration of solutes as water always wants to even out. Oncotic pressure is also known as colloid pressure. And this is pressure of albumin being in the blood. Much like osmosis, the pressure of the albumin keeps the fluid in the blood as water is being pushed in that direction. Let's review osmosis again, as it can be a tricky subject for many students. As you recall from AP1 and AP2, when a red blood cell is exposed to a hypertonic solution, all the water of the cells or the intracellular free water will leak out trying to even out the water. In an isotonic solution, the red cells will be happy and no change as the amount of water is the same both inside the cell and out. Lastly, in a hypotonic solution, water will rush inside the cell as there is more water outside the cell than inside the cell and the water enters the, the cell toward the higher concentration of solutes and the cell will burst. Here are some of the IV fluids we use most commonly in medicine. Normal saline, which is 0.9% sodium chloride, is isotonic, while any amount lower in percentage of NaCl is hypotonic to the blood. Any amount higher of NaCl is hypertonic to the blood. Lactated ringer solution is also isotonic. D5W, which stands for 5% dextrose in water, is more hypotonic, although it is considered isotonic. Anything added to D5W makes it hypertonic to the blood. So what would happen if, say, the hydrostatic pressure was increased, but the osmotic pressure stayed the same? Then the fluid goes into tissues, but is also filtered off by the kidneys. If the patient has too much sodium on board, then they may have edema for some time. If they have heart failure, which will slow down the flow of the fluid, then this too may increase the time they have edema. Therefore, we fluid limit patients with heart failure, kidney failure as well. What if the hydrostatic and osmotic pressures are the same? Then no net movement will occur. What if the hydro pre hydrostatic pressure is, is less than the osmotic pressure? Then there would be movement of fluid into the capillaries. Now what about if uh, uh, osmotic pressure is low? Then the fluid will leave the capillary and enter the tissues, uh, like when there is less albumin in the blood, like in cirrhosis or in nephrotic syndrome. Therefore, these patients will have edema and swelling of the tissues. As you recall, ADH, which is antidiuretic hormone, also called vasopressin, is made by the hypothalamus and released by the posterior pituitary. The purpose of this hormone is to increase blood volume and constrict arterioles. It increases blood volume by increasing water reabsorption by the kidneys. Is there another hormone that also increases blood volume? Remember, it is aldosterone. In the RAAS, or the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, which we have discussed, aldosterone also increases blood volume or the extracellular volume. It does so differently by absorbing sodium, and water then follows by osmosis. At the same time, angiotensin constricts arteries, and the RAAS will thus increase blood pressure based on the blood pressure experienced by the renal artery. 
Naturesis is like diuresis with a loss of water, but also the loss of salt or sodium. There are proteins made in the body released from the heart and blood vessels that can help lower blood volume when it gets too high. In the case of heart failure, this system is not as effective, but we can use the elevated BNP to help us make the diagnosis if we are confused between the patients of COPD or CHF. Both ANP and BNP released from the heart will increase GFR and initiate naturesis, which will lower blood volume and therefore blood pressure. Edema is swelling of the tissues. It occurs, as we said, from high hydrostatic pressure or low osmotic pressure in the ECF or blood vessels or both. So if the patient has heart failure and high hydrostatic pressure, especially right side heart failure, they can see edema like this pitting edema. If the patient has cirrhosis, then they will have low albumin serum levels called hypoalbuminemia which causes low osmotic pressure of the blood vessels, or ECF, and then the fluid heads into the tissues or the interstitial spaces. Sodium retention will, will increase hydrostatic pressure as well, and if a patient has heart failure, cirrhosis, or kidney failure, they must have a low sodium diet because of this. Fluid entering the interstitial spaces will find it any place it can. Third spacing of fluid means it goes to the spaces between the parietal and visceral pleura and peritoneum. If the pleura, then pleural effusions. If the peritoneum, then ascites. Here is the take-home message for you. What causes edema and third spacing? Pleural effusions and ascites. Heart failure, especially right-sided. Cirrhosis, renal failure, malnutrition. Why? Increased hydrostatic pressure and or decreased osmotic pressure. CHF increases hydrostatic pressure. Cirrhosis decreases osmotic pressure due to hypoalbuminemia. Renal failure can do both if nephrotic syndrome. What about the opposite of hypervolemia? Dehydration or hypovolemia is where the patient lacks water. ICF begins to lower, causing cells to shrink. How will the body respond to this state? It does so in several ways. Each way is meant to increase bodily fluid and preserve homeostasis. To keep the blood pressure elevated, the heart beats faster and vasoconstriction occurs because of the RAAS. The sense of thirst is stimulated in an attempt to get the person to take in fluids. Osmoreceptors are stimulated in the hypothalamus initiating a thirst response. Baroreceptors feeling the hypotension will stimulate heart rate and vasoconstriction. Lack of blood pressure at the renal artery will stimulate the RAAS. Osmoreceptors at the posterior pituitary will stimulate ADH release causing water resorption at the kidney. How do you assess the volume status in a patient? In the hospital, you can do daily weight. Most hospital beds allow this. Keep good records of 24-hour input and output of fluids. Keep track of vital signs as tachycardia and hypotension can be signs of dehydration. Orthostatic hypotension or a drop in blood pressure with standing can be a sign of dehydration, but also blood loss. Look at skin turgor. If the skin of the patient can easily tint then there is less skin turgor, which means dehydration. If urine output begins to drop, then there could be dehydration as well. If there is edema forming and daily weights are going up, then think about volume overload. The assessment of skin turgor is a useful physical exam skill. Skin is easier to pinch and will hold the form of your pinch if the patient is dehydrated. This is especially true in the elderly. Less skin turgor means dehydration. More skin turgor means they are well hydrated. Edema, of course, means they're volume overloaded. Let's go over the electrolyte imbalances using a table so it's easier to study. First is hyponatremia or low sodium. This can occur with a patient with hypervolemia or hypovolemia. If the patient is dehydrated or has hypovolemia, then this is due to loss of sodium, usually from overuse of diuretics or severe dehydration. If the patient is fluid or volume overloaded, then the sodium is dilutional from too much water on board. This is the case in SIADH, or Syndrome of Inappropriate ADH. Then we must fluid restrict the patient. Hyponatremia can cause seizures depending on how it, low it goes. Muscle cramping can also be experienced by these patients. If the patient is hypovolemic, they may have tachycardia and hypotension. If hypovolemic hyponatremia, then IV fluid replacement slowly to avoid brain damage called central pontine myelinolysis.
If hyponatremia or too high serum sodium level, the most common cause is loss of free water, which can happen with diabetes insipidus. You can see hypervolemic hypernatremia, but this is rare and usually due to both excessive sodium and water intake, possibly from excessive IV fluids that are hypertonic. Replace the free water and give ADH if DI. Hypokalemia is loss of potassium and usually from diuretic use. It can cause leg cramps and EKG changes like the U-wave. Fix it by replacing potassium if IV, then do so slowly or you could cause cardiac arrest. Digitalis toxicity is, the toxicity is possible, so replace potassium before giving digoxin or digitalis. Hyperkalemia is usually from renal failure and overuse of potassium. You can see the tall and peak T waves on EKG. Potassium imbalances can cause cardiac arrest. To treat this one is tricky. If the kidneys are okay, then give diuretics and IV fluids. If renal failure and above 7, then dialysis is best. You can also use the gut and give KX late, which will pull potassium from the bowels. Giving IV insulin and D50 will only buy you some time with hyperkalemia as it is a temporary fix. Hypocalcemia is usually from osteoporosis or lack of calcium and vitamin D in the diet. They'll have neuromuscular excitability and tetany, positive Chavostek sign and Trousseau signs. Give them calcium and vitamin D for treatment. If acute pancreatitis, then IV calcium, or if severe, then the same thing. Hypercalcemia comes from bone cancers, bone breakdown, hyperparathyroidism, and patients who are bedbound. They will have decreased neuromuscular excitability, and cardiac arrhythmias are possible, like with low calcium. IV bisphosphonates will force calcium back into bone. If the patient has calcium uh, kidney stones, they may need help passing these or need ure ureteroscopy and basketing procedures to get them if they cannot pass themselves. Again, for hypokalemia, this is when you could see a U wave, which occurs after the T wave. If in hyperkalemia, the T waves are taller and peaked. In hypocalcemia, you could see Chavostek sign, which is when there is twitching of the cheek and blinking of the eye upon tapping the cheek of a patient. This is due to the tetany of hypocalcemia. Trusosan can also be seen with hypocalcemia. And this is carpal spasms of the arm if a blood pressure cuff is inflated and worn for two or three minutes, causing the hand to flex at the wrist. This is again a result of the muscle tetany seen with hypocalcemia. <clears throat> the last two electrolytes are usually associated with either low calcium or potassium. Hypophosphatemia is seen in starved or malnourished people or alcoholics. It can cause tremors or weakness. Remember, we use phosphorus to make ATP, so when you, uh, when you refeed a starved patient, you need to give phosphorus if the level is low or a refeeding syndrome can occur. Hyperphosphatemia accompanies hypocalcemia, so the very same symptoms can occur. Renal failure is a main cause of elevated phosphorus levels, and in end-stage renal disease patients, they must watch how much they take in daily. Correct the hypocalcemia to treat hyperphosphatemia. Hypomagnesemia can occur with hypocalcemia and with hypokalemia. If with hypokalemia, then magnesium must be replaced before the potassium or the potassium level will not rise very fast. GI loss from diarrhea, alcohol abuse, sepsis, and laxative abuse can all cause hypomagnesemia. Hypermagnesemia can occur in renal failure patients. It has muscular and cardiac manifestations and can be treated emergently with IV calcium gluconate, but if not severe, then just monitor. We use IV magnesium for preeclampsia in pregnancy and have to monitor for hypermagnesemia in these patients. The kidneys are an essential organ as they remove toxic substances from the body through the, excre through the excretion of urine. They also absorb back what we need and maintain the acid-base balance of the, of the blood. They control our blood pressure, help in vitamin D formation, help in glucose homeostasis, and secrete the needed hormone erythropoietin to stimulate red blood cell production in the bones. Renal failure is a growing issue for many patients. The most common cause is uncontrolled diabetes mellitus along with uncontrolled hypertension. There are other causes too like autoimmune diseases and hereditary conditions. End-stage renal disease has become a major problem as many wait for kidney transplants and live on dialysis. In the United States, we have a population of patients who are not good kidney transplant recipients and essentially live out their lives on dialysis. 
the kidneys receive a whopping one-fifth of the cardiac output. The way we calculate how well the kidneys are uh, functioning is by the GFR, or glomerular filtration rate. If the GFR is high or increased, then the kidney function is good. If the GFR is low or decreased, then the kidney function is worsening. GFR naturally worsens or decreases with aging, but many other factors can affect the GFR. The basic unit of the kidney is the nephron. Each one will filter the blood and push waste into the urine. The glomerular capillaries high pressure allow for filtration to take place, and you recall from AP that this is a passive transport and diffusion influenced by blood pressure in this case. The parts of the nephron consist of the proximal tubule, which is the segment following Bowman's capsule, and reabsorbs the majority of filtrates from the urine. The loop of Henle, which concentrates the filtered fluid, this is also where loop diuretics work and get their name from uh, like hydrochlorothiazide or HCTZ. The distal tubule, which is where aldosterone acts to reabsorb sodium and water uh, follows by osmosis. And the collecting ducts where ADH ab absorbs free water. Again, the kidneys do a lot for the body and help to maintain homeostasis in several ways. They aid in acid-base balance. Uh, keep the blood and keep the blood neutral. This is why kidney failure can cause metabolic acidosis and dehydration can cause metabolic alkalosis. They eliminate waste from the body, which would make us very ill if they did not. They secrete EPO to make red blood cells and renin to raise the blood pressure when needed. Vitamin D synthesis finishes here, and this helps with calcium balance along with secretion or reabsorption of calcium from the urine. Glucose homeostasis is also a function of the kidneys to help maintain the proper balance of glucose as it can be toxic to the body if glucose levels remain too high for too long. The kidneys also get rid of certain drugs and medications, which would build up in our system otherwise. If the kidneys are not functioning, then all these benefits would cease or at least be suppressed. Remember that insulin is eliminated by the kidneys, so a patient with diabetes mellitus and renal failure may need less insulin, otherwise they could have hypoglycemia. Kidney failure has two main types, acute and chronic. Chronic renal failure is kidney disease over a long period of time, usually dealing with such diseases as diabetic nephropathy or an autoimmune disease like lupus. Acute renal failure, also call, uh, called acute kidney injury, is new onset of renal failure and has three types. First is pre-renal or before the kidney like dehydration, blood loss, or fluid immobilization problems like cirrhosis or heart failure. Next is intrinsic, which deals with a direct attack on the kidney like acute tubular necrosis or ATN. Last is postrenal, and this is obstruction of the urine outflow like with kidney stones or in a large prostate in men. AKI or acute kidney injury, as we discussed before, can be pre-renal, post-renal, or intrinsic. The initial stage is where the insult begins, then oliguria can commence as the GFR slows down and fluid overload begins. Diuresis will then happen and the kidneys are getting rid of fluid but not concentrating the urine properly. Recovery should then happen as the kidney heals. Pre-renal failure is before the kidney, so it deals with dehydration or hypovolemia. It can also come from fluid immobilization, like in CHF, or cirrhosis, where the fluid third spaces and cannot be filtered by the kidneys. Intrinsic is damage to the kidney itself. It can be from trauma, polynephritis, autoimmune diseases like lupus, group A beta hemolytic strip, as well as before, as, as, uh, as we talked about before, or due to nephrotic agents. Post-renal failure is obstructive renal failure. This can be due to kidney stones and a large prostate, bladder cancer, bladder stones. You will see hydronephrosis of the kidney. This is the most common cause of acute kidney injury, which is the initiation of acute renal failure potentially. If enough of the tubules are injured, then this will lead to an acute renal failure and would be intrinsic renal failure. To assess the kidneys, we need a good history and physical examination. Does the patient have diabetes mellitus or hypertension? Is there a family history of polycystic kidney disease? What medications do they take? What does the urine look like? What are the urinary habits less frequent or more frequent? Determine if the patient has a CVA or a costovertebral angle tenderness. 
Could this be uh, polynephritis or a kidney stone? We need to assess the urine as this is the product of the kidneys and will give us a picture of what's going wrong with the kidneys. If there's blood, this could be a stone or cancer. If proteinuria, could it be nephrotic syndrome? If tea colored, this could be bilirubin and show problems with the liver. In a urinalysis, we can assess pH, specific gravity, glucose, ketones, leukocyte esterase, nitrides, protein, bilirubin, by looking at the urobilinogen. And if we look at the urine under the microscope, then we can see if there are crystals or casts. Urinalysis samples should be done with a clean catch to decrease the number of contaminants. A urinalysis is just a dipstick test of a urine sample. It can be run on a computer or, like here, by eye reading color changes from the bottle. A urinalysis covers pH, or if the sample is more acidic or basic, a check for uh, blood or microscopic hematuria. Specific gravity, which tells us if the patient just gave us toilet water, which happens in drug testing. Ketones, if they are starving or have diabetes. Glucose, if they have diabetes. Leukocyesterase, if white cells are present. Nitrite show if bacteria are present. And lastly, it can show bilirubin in the urine, which occurs in cirrhosis or liver disease. Blood urea nitrogen, or BUN, can be used to assess the kidney function, but is not as accurate as creatinine. Both are measured from the blood serum, and creatinine is better at, at, at it is more specific to the kidney, while BUN can be elevated due to the gut too. A 24-hour creatinine clearance is the best lab to measure GFR, as creatinine is a byproduct of protein breakdown that is exclusively eliminated by the kidney, and you do a urine collection for 24 hours and blood draws to go with it. The result is the most accurate picture of the kidney's, uh, patient's kidney function that we can obtain. A decreased GFR will have a decreased creatinine clearance. An increased GFR will have an increased creatinine clearance. Do not con get confused with the levels, though, as an increased serum creatinine can be due to a decreased GFR, and a decreased serum creatinine level can be due to an increased GFR. Also remember, GFR is kidney function. So an increased GFR means good kidney function, and a decreased GFR means poor kidney function. Both BUN and creatinine can be elevated in a really muscular person, especially if they are taking protein supplements, and we can determine if the kidneys are damaged by the 24-hour creatinine clearance. A KUB x-ray film is a picture of the kidneys, ureters, and bladder, and used to look for kidney stones. Only calcium kidney stones can be seen on an x-ray film like this, and calcium is the most common type of kidney stone. You can see other stones by using dye, and this is an IVP x-ray study. An ultrasound in the kidneys can help us assess kidney size. This is important as acute kidney injury may have an enlarged kidney. This is called hydronephrosis. In chronic kidney disease, like this kidney, it is usually smaller than normal. A CT or computerized tomography scan is also an x-ray, but a lot more images and in cross-sections. We can see calcium stones well on non-contrasted CT scans like this, large stones in the patient's right kidney here. Hemodialysis is used to treat chronic kidney disease once it's reached CKD4, uh, 5, or end-stage renal disease. It uses large catheter inserted into a, a large vein, but ideally the patient will need to develop a good access with an arterial venous fistula or AV fistula for the best exchange. Acute renal failure patients can also go on hemodialysis temporarily until their native kidney function returns. Hemodialysis is supposed to be used to bridge a patient to a kidney transplant, but in this country it becomes a way of life for many who are not transplant candidates for various reasons and stay on hemodialysis to stay alive. Peritoneal dialysis or PD is an alternative to hemodialysis and can be done in home, although there is a home hemodialysis but requires meticulous sterile habits to prevent infections. PD is, a, is better at, home, better at uh, uh, home dialysis as it uses a catheter in the abdomen or peritoneum, which then gets filled with dialysate at night while the patient sleeps, then is emptied in the morning to complete the exchange. CRRT or continuous renal replacement therapy is used on critically ill patients in shock 
They have renal failure requiring dialysis. It gently performs dialysis slowly over a 24-hour period, and this helps patients with hypotension. Chronic kidney disease can be divided into five stages. The purpose of the staging system is to prepare the patient for possible dialysis. As they progress to CKD5, they enter in stage renal disease and must have hemodialysis. There are steps to, take, uh, to get them there if this occurs slowly and progressively, like getting the patient uh, an arterial venous fistula started and matured in case they go on hemodialysis relatively soon. The purpose of CKD staging and kidney disease management is to keep patients off dialysis as long as we can. With dialysis comes risks like hepatitis B and other infections. If they are a kidney transplant candidate, the wait is still very long. We can do things to help prolong their native kidney function as long as we can by controlling their blood pressure and using certain medications depending on the cause of their CKD. As the patient progresses through the stages of CKD, they will experience a host of complications such as the ones you see listed here. Electrolyte abnormalities like we went over at the beginning of this lecture as well as anemias and thrombocytopenias as we discussed in previous lectures. Polycystic kidney disease is an autosomal dominant genetic disease. Many members of the family have it and know it, and several will be, uh, be on some form of, of dialysis or have an, uh, had a kidney transplant. Patients will have kidney pain, hypertension, renal calculi due to the malforming kidneys. Diagnosis is made by imaging studies, but also from history. As we have mentioned earlier, beta hemolytic strip can cause kidney damage, and it does so with post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. This is an immunological attack on the on glomerulus and can lead to end stage renal disease and dialysis and can happen in young people. This is why streptococcal pharyngitis must be treated. Nephrotic syndrome is a condition where the glomerulus is damaged, and this causes leakage of protein or albumin in the urine. If allowed to continue, the patient will reach CKD4 and then end-stage renal disease. This is why diabetes must be well controlled. We check diabetics for microalbumin in the urine to uh, screen for early signs of nephropathy like this. Think of the O in nephrotic as protein out to help you remember that this disease deals with the spilling of protein in the urine. ACE inhibitors have shown to slow down the progression of this disease. Nephrolithiasis or kidney stones. They are not painful till they travel down a ureter, and many may not know they have them without an x-ray or other study to find them. Most kidney stones are calcium stones, and uric acid is the second leading cause. Struvite stones are found in patients with chronic kidney disease, Foley catheters, and recurrent infections. Cysteine stones are genetically caused due to an inability to process cysteine effectively leading to excretion in the urine. This table is a good resource for showing you how kidney stones are made and which types are more prevalent. Calcium stones are very common. We are not going to hold you accountable for the specific type of calcium stone though. But you should know that calcium stones show up on x-ray and the others do not. And that uric acid stones come from gout and struvite stones make the classic staghorn calculus and come from chronic Foley catheters in immobilized patients with recurrent U UTIs with urease splitting microorganisms. Cysteine stones are from a genetic disorder. A patient with nephrolithiasis who now has urethro urethrolithiasis will present with flank pain and hematuria. They may have uh, costovertebral tenderness or CVA tenderness. Fever may be present if there is a post-obstructive infection. Most stones will pass, however, and just need time to do so. NSAIDs are best at pain relief, like ibuprofen, for example. Stones that will not pass can have a uteroscopy and basketing to remove them. A laser can be used to cut down large stones or remove in pieces. Lithotripsy is sound waves used to break up stones and takes much longer. Surgery can be done, but this is most invasive. Dietary changes may be needed along with drinking more fluids. Urinate tract infections are very common. There are two main ones to know, pyelonephritis and cystitis. Pyelonephritis is a kidney infection. It has fever, chills, and is much more serious. Sometimes it's hard to tell if it is pyelonephritis or nephrolithiasis, but the urinalysis will show pyuria and not just hematuria. You can also have an obstructive pyelonephritis from a urethral stone. The patient will have flank pain as well as all the symptoms of cystitis. 
Cystitis is a bladder infection and is very common. It will have dysuria but no fever. Increased urgency in a foul urine called pyuria. The most common urinate uh, bacterial infection is E. coli. Pyelonephritis will have fever and pyuria on urinalysis. Cystitis will have pyuria but no fever. Asymptomatic bacteria should not be treated and just watched. You can further evaluate pyelonephritis with an ultrasound of the kidneys or a CT scan, preferably not contrasted since the patient is already having kidney issues. Cystitis is not as serious as pyelonephritis, but it, if it goes untreated, it can lead to sepsis. Symptoms are similar to pyelonephritis, except without the flank pain and no fever. E. coli is the leading bacterial cause. Women get cystitis more than men due to their short urethras. There are several risk factors for cystitis, all listed here for you to review. Diagnosis is by urinalysis with similar findings to pyelonephritis. You will have positive leukocyte esterase a byproduct of white blood cells, and a positive nitrites, which is a byproduct of bacteria. There will also be protein, and the urine itself may be purulent. Cystitis is uncommon in young men, and if present, should be investigated thoroughly. If it is in young men, then vesicular re uh, reflux may be the cause, which is urine going back into the kidneys from the bladder, then back again. Symptoms of cystitis can include increased frequency, burning with urination, called dysuria, and the feeling of having to void, which is urgency. Hematuria may be present. Fever is not a symptom of a simple or complicated cystitis. Foley catheters in hospitals can lead to resistant urinary tract infections and the formation of struvite calculi if left for long-term in bedridden patients. These are known as staghorn calculi. Good pasture syndrome is an immunological attack on the kidneys. It is a form of small vessel vasculitis where the basement membrane of the glomerulus is attacked by antibodies. The patient can have progressive renal failure that can be rapid. The worst form of this disease also involves the lungs, and these patients have HLA-DR15 tissue type positive on biopsy. Immune modulating medications must be used, treating along with plasmapheresis to decrease the number of these antibodies. The hallmark diagnostic finding is the presence of anti-GBM in the serum as well as biopsy showing the same antibody. The bladder is used to store the urine until it is ready to void. The detrusor muscle is the major muscle of the bladder. It is innervated both sympathetically and parasympathetically. There is also voluntary control when we go to void, but there is involuntary parts as well that can cause incontinence. Obstructive uropathy is a common problem and due to urethral stones from the kidneys. Prolonged obstruction can cause hydronephrosis and hydroureter. This can cause damage to the kidney. See the arrow. As the CT progresses, you can see the kidney with contrast remaining in it due to the obstruction of a kidney stone. Hydroureter is dilation of the ureter and hydronephrosis is dilation of the renal uh, calluses and pelvis. This can come from a vesicular urethral reflux or obstruction from a stone. It is reversible if acute and the obstruction is removed. We can scope the bladder as high as the ureters to detect various pathologies. Biopsy can be taken and stones can be removed from the ureters. Interstitial cystitis or IC is pelvic pain along with bladder fullness or an urgency. This can also mimic pelvic floor pain, which is a bit different. The cause is unknown, and most of the time there are no ulcers seen on cystoscopy, but, but if there are, then it can be diagnostic. Urodynamic studies can be done like we would do in incontinence to assess bladder function. No treatment is entirely curative. There has been some relief with anticholinergic medications and avoiding certain foods. Transurethral botulism injections have helped. Urinary incontinence is a serious issue. Many women and some men live with this every day and think it is normal. They will not talk to their providers about it and suffer in silence. Long-term urinary incontinence has been shown to increase risk for dementia and therefore needs to be addressed. There are two main types. Stress, which is incontinence with coughing, laughing, or sneezing, and urge incontinence that makes the patient feel they must go quickly to the bathroom several times a day. Stress is mostly an anatomical problem, our urge is neurological.
many women have some of both contributing to their incontinence. Workup for urinary incontinence is similar to that of IC. Urodynamic studies are the most useful, like the one pictured here. It can study how the bladder behaves before and after voiding. Then you can get a post-void residual to see how much the bladder is holding on after each void. You can also do the cotton swab and cough test during this test. Treatments include a pessary device, which is like a disc placed in the vagina to help pull the bladder up, or bladder sling surgeries using artificial slings or cadaver tissue. Botox has also been helpful with urge incontinence. Medications like anticholinergics are also useful. The prostate is just inferior to the bladder in men and can cause obstruction from BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia or from prostatitis. BPH comes from enlargement of the prostate gland over time due to less use in age. Treatment is, is medicines to reduce prostate size or a TERP, which is a transurethral resection of the prostate. Prostatitis can be acute or chronic and is due to viruses mostly, but can also be a bacterial infection. Treatment is antibiotics and medications to reduce prostate size. Prostate cancer will happen to all men if they live long enough. Screening testing with a PSA, digital rectal examination, and other methods have not proven beneficial. Treatment is radiation, seed implantation, direct radiation, chemotherapy, and medications that can stop testosterone and freeze the cancer in place for years. For more aggressive types, radical prostatectomy can be done. Robots are used in this surgery to preserve nerves so erection can be preserved. Bladder cancer is from smoking cigarettes and can present with gross or macroscopic hematuria. This should be further investigated and a cystoscopy planned as early detection means preservation of the bladder. Loss in the bladder will result in either a new bladder made from GI tissue or a urostomy being made for urine to exit the body. The most common type of bladder cancer is transitional cell carcinoma, and you need to know this for the examination. Kidney cancer is also from cigarette smoking. It presents as hematuria-like bladder cancer. Diagnostic imaging is the only way to see if there is kidney cancer present. Then do a kidney biopsy to confirm the type. If early stage, then only a, por a portion of, uh, or all the kidney is removed if metastasis and chemotherapy and radiation. Let's do some questions to help you prepare for the exam this week. 75-year-old male with a long history of smoking is found to have painless gross hematuria. All of his labs are otherwise normal. What would not be a reasonable next step in this patient's evaluation? What is your answer here? The answer is urine protein collection. The patient has blood in his urine from something bleeding in the urinary system. This would not be useful. We use the urine protein collection to assess for nephropathy. This patient is likely has a bladder or kidney cancer. A 25-year-old male who, has an, who was in an automobile accident resulting in spinal trauma above C4 making him a quadriplegic requiring a ventilator. He has had a chronic Foley catheter for over a year and has had repeated infections with Proteus mirabilis, which is a urea splitting microorganism. He has been having issues with repeated urolithiasis that are staghorn calculi. What type of stone is most likely in this patient? What is your answer here? This is likely struvite stones given his immobility, use of Foley catheter chronically, and recurrent infections with urea splitting bacteria. 65 year old African American female presents with proteinuria by dipstick. She has some increase in creatinine and a decreased GFR with a 24-hour urine creatinine collection. She has greater than 200 milligrams of protein on the same collection. She has had diabetes mellitus type 2 for 20 years and has an HbA1c of 8.5 percent which is not well controlled. What type of kidney disease is most likely in this patient? What is your answer here? The answer is diabetic nephropathy. Remember protein out, get you to remember that nephropathy has protein spilling in the urine, albumin. Diabetes is the leading cause of nephropathy. A 25 year old Olympic gold medal winning bodybuilder presents to your clinic for a checkup. He is found to have an elevated serum creatinine and BUN. You are concerned that he may have kidney disease. 
He emits the protein supplements and has a large body mass above average for his height and most likely and most least muscle with low body fat percentage. What would be the best way to determine his, if his creatinine and BUN elevation is just due to his muscle mass and protein supplementation? What is your answer here? The answer is a 24-hour urine creatinine collection to get the creatinine clearance to calculate GFR. This would show that the elevated serum creatinine was a false positive for kidney disease. All the other tests would not be helpful. What is the fluid found within the capillaries called? What is your answer here? The answer is the extracellular fluid or ECF. A 65-year-old female presents with muscle tetany, and she has a positive Shavostek sign and Trousseau sign. She is a chronic alcoholic and has bouts of diarrhea and abuses laxatives often. What is a likely diagnosis? What is your answer here? The answer is hypomagnesemia. It is accompanied by hypocalcemia and also hyperphosphatemia. All three could be answers to this question, so be aware of the relationship between these three electrolyte imbalances. Thirty-five-year-old female presents with flank pain, fever, and chills. She has dysuria, urgency, and foul-smelling urine. Upon examination, you see she has a right-side CVA tenderness. Your analysis reveals no blood, positive leukocyte esterase and nitrites, as well as proteins. What is your diagnosis? What is your answer here? The answer is palonephritis as the patient has dysuria, urgency, fever, chills, flank pain, and CVA tenderness on the right side. She also has pyuria of the urine shown by your analysis. It is not cystitis as she has fever and flank pain with CVA tenderness. IC is not likely either with the infection. She has no blood in the urine, so nephrolithiasis would also be unlikely. This ends the week six lecture. Now go lick that exam.